You know, it's challenging for me because I have to keep opening and closing this sliding glass door to this porch, the little porch, and uh, I'm letting the air out and in, meaning that I can't close the door completely because I have this cable that I need to adjust. And while we're adjusting it, you can look at the book and think about that. <laughs> Which is why we're real here, because it's what your world is like, isn't it? Are you so all together that you don't have challenges in your morning or day or noon that you don't need God? <laughs> oh, please. We all need God. You know that. I do. I don't always need coffee, but boy, sometimes it helps. But you know, sometimes when people talk about God, they get esoteric, or they get holy, or they get reverent, or they get far away, or they get distant. And sometimes they don't get just like the aspect of, if God created you and made you the way you are, maybe he loves you the way you are. And that he has something he planned out, like you planned for your children, for a better future a new tomorrow, an exciting eternity. Eternity begins today if you're willing to examine it and see what it is that God would do for you if you want to walk with Him. The way I do is I get a devotional. I read my Bible. I pray. I talk to God and at first, you know, maybe I didn't hear him as clearly as I might have wanted to or thought I did. But then, one day, he spoke to me audibly. And from that moment on, something I've always taught is that not only should you, not only could you, not only would he, not only should he, but the more that you decide to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God, and the more that you read your Bible daily, the more that you... Apply it to your mind as you think about it. Don't just read it. You know, stop where you're at. Think about it for a while. You know, consider what you're reading. Not just apply it, but think about it. Think about what's being said here and how it works and what it works towards. Because sometimes I think that people think that faith is an ignorant thing and that in reality, no, it's the most practical, it is the most intelligent, and it is the most intellectual thing that you can do is to have faith. And that if you apply those three aspects of faith to it, intellect, intelligence, and practicality, then your world will become not your oyster. <laughs> Although if you figure out how an oyster makes it, well, anyways, <laughs> a pearl, and, you know, sand, and, you know, and chewing on that sucker. But if you apply those to your way of reading the scripture, then you will hear God speak eventually when he chooses to, not when you want to. And when God spoke to me, he floored me. I mean, not much that you can say when God speaks. So in the meantime, by faith, we hear God speak sometimes through the words, sometimes through devotionals, sometimes through emotions, sometimes through feelings, sometimes through circumstance. Sometimes for all the different ways that God prepares us for the day when we'll see him face to face. And we will hear his voice. And we can hear his voice today. Because Jesus said that my sheep hear my voice and they know me. They will not follow the voice of another. And that is where you want to be with your relationship with God. Is to a point where you hear God speak. And not only that, you tell people you hear God speak. Because anyone can claim to hear God speak and write about it. But... When you get in somebody's face, you know, and somebody says, you know, well, does God talk to you? And I usually go, as a matter of fact, he does. <laughs> so in Spurgeon, as God is speaking to us. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh so that all that hear will laugh with me. It was whenever they write something like scrolled in the first letter, you know, you kind of go, is that a I, a F, a, what is that letter? It was far above the power of nature and even contrary to its laws that the aged Sarah should be honored with a son. 
Even so, it is beyond all ordinary rules that I, a poor, helpless, undone sinner, should find grace to bear about in my soul the indwelling spirit of the Lord Jesus. I, who am once despaired, as well as I might, for my nature was as dry and withered and barren and accursed as a howling wilderness, even I have been made to bring forth fruit unto holiness. Well may my mouth be filled with joyous laughter because of the singular surprising grace which I have received of the Lord. For I have found Jesus, the promised seed, and he is mine forever. This day will I lift up psalms of triumph unto the Lord who has remembered my low estate. For my heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. I would have all those that hear of my great deliverance from hell and my most blessed visitation from on high laugh for joy with me. I would surprise my family with abundant peace. I would delight my friends with my ever-increasing happiness. I would edify the church with my grateful confessions and even impress the world with my cheerfulness of my daily conversation. Bunyan tells us that Mercy laughed in her sleep. And no wonder when she dreamed of Jesus, my joy shall not stop short of hers while my beloved is the theme of my daily thoughts. The Lord Jesus is a deep sea of joy. My soul shall therein, my soul shall dive therein and shall be swallowed up in the delights of his society. Sarah looked on her Isaac and laughed with excess of rapture and all her friends laughed with her and thou my soul look on thy Jesus and bid heaven and earth unite in thy joy unspeakable. You know, there is a great delight in the freedom to laugh, to enjoy, to participate in something that just gives you a kick in the head, as I say. And I guess the old expression was, ain't that a kick in the head from some days gone by. But for me, it was like, joy wasn't a workup of some gift of the spirit or some fruit, you know, that made us look like fruit loopies. But rather, it was just an ongoing process of thinking and considering what God has done and feeling that warm glow just kind of fill you and take away the years of pain and suffering. And you find yourself almost seeing Jesus as he is. Although for me, when I see Jesus as he is, it's semi-sorrow because I, I know he bears the scars of my sinfulness. And I know that he has a face that's marred beyond all recognition. But the man of God that he has become for me, the son of man, as tender and as expressive as he is in all of his fullness as son of God and as God, in the little things that I used to do between him and I, which was with my thumbs, and I would stare down and picture them together, you know, kind of like rubbing, whatever. The scripture says, kiss the sun lest he be angry. And for me, that's not a homosexual thing. Because in many cultures, kissing a man is not something that's strange, but a token of respect. And so in the Middle East, I didn't find that uncommon. Or Russian Orthodox or some of the other churches. But when you love someone, when you have a genuine, as I wrote in a book, uh, 1,000 years, Genesis age, when you have man love, it is intimate in a way that doesn't fear for its sensuality or sexuality, but it is a man love divine of God and man. Yes, I love Jesus. <laughs> and yes, he makes me laugh and you could say that was a giggle for a male or a snicker for a man, but you don't have to be rapturously bouncing around in a worship service to know what laughter is when it's with God and not claim that it's holy laughter, but you can enjoy the fullness of your emotions if you just give them to Jesus and let it be there with Him and you and not with others. I pray you're not caught up into some holy laughter message or some way of exaggerating what God really meant when he said that 
come and laugh with me and enjoy the fullness of the Lord, for surely he has become my salvation and he has become my redemption, and he is my all and all. <laughs> that, including the deep laughter I get, isn't holy laughter. It's just laughter. But it's laughter with the one that I know. And that's the difference. Laugh with, not at or because of God. But laugh with God. And you'll know what really holy laughter is all about. God loves you. Today, be still some point in time. Let him, please, speak to you. <laughs> and then maybe you'll laugh about it. He might have something funny to say to you. Maybe.